Your Legislators is made possible by the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota Corn are proud to invest in third-party research leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers. On the web at MFU.org. Good evening and welcome to this week's version of Your Legislators. My name is Barry Anderson. I'm your host and moderator for the program this week and all the weeks that follow until the legislature goes home. This is your opportunity to ask questions of your legislators. And you can do so by sending your questions in to uh, our program via email at yourtv at pioneer.org. Or you can also do this by way of uh, the old fashioned telephone, 800-726-3178. That information will appear on your screen periodically as we go through our program this evening. We begin this evening, this week, as we do each week by introducing our distinguished panel of guests. We're grateful for their uh, attendance this evening. They'll help us unravel the mysteries of St. Paul. And let's begin with Senator Mary Kunish from District 41 of New Brighton. Senator Kunish has been with us on multiple occasions in the past. Tell us, or tell our viewers a little bit about yourself issues that are of concern in this legislative session. Introduce yourself generally to those who've tuned in this evening. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to be here with you this evening. Uh, I'm the Senator for the communities of St. Anthony Village and New Brighton, Columbia Heights and Hilltop, Fridley, and a little bit of Spring Lake Park. I'm in my second year as a Senator, but I was four years in the House. So um, I had a little bit of experience over there and um, I'm, uh, I'm really thankful to have these opportunities. I was a teacher for 25 years and just retired about a year ago as a library media specialist. So issues of education and literacy and access to resources is, um, you know, really, really important to me, especially as we are trying to navigate still through this pandemic and um, our teachers are doing just the very best that they can to uh, to ensure that our kids, um, you know, are still getting something as best they can. And so I, we really appreciate those uh, teachers and administrators and everyone else from the bus driver to the uh, food service folks who, who keep the schools running. Um, I am a descendant of the Standing Rock tribe and so a lot of the issues that I also work on uh, in the legislature are around um, Indian uh, Native American issues. And uh, three years ago, I passed the first in the nation uh, missing and murdered Indigenous Women's Task Force. And we completed that task force and um, came up with a series of recommendations. The very first recommendation was to create a permanent missing and murdered Indigenous relatives office in our state government to um, continue the work that we started with the task force. And so again, leading in the nation, um, I passed that legislation last year. And we are hoping to announce our director for that office and um, continue the work both at the state level and at the federal level, seeing as um, our president has has um, has tasked with our, our Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, to, to work on this issue at the federal level. And knowing the, the intersection of violence between our Native women as well as our Black women, they are the, the top two um, recipients of violence in our in our communities in our state in our nation uh, we also created the very first missing and murdered african-american task force uh, and very proud to serve on that so education um, native american issues uh, the environment of course is really important and just making sure that we are providing the resources to our uh, our, our minnesotans around the the state so that especially during this pandemic time and as we move hopefully out of it for the 
for the next time um, that they're able to be healthy and happy and thrive. So thank you for letting me to be here tonight. Oh, we're delighted to have you and thank you for that introduction. Also joining us, also from the State Senate, uh, Eric Pratt from District 55, Prior Lake. Senator Pratt has also been a frequent guest over many years. Senator Pratt and I were visiting before we went on the air about his experience at the University of Colorado, uh, played football there, uh, uh, which I, I guess that qualifies you for the Senate, right? I, I don't, maybe, there's a, maybe, there's, maybe there's some connection there. I don't know. Anyway, Senator Pratt, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you, uh, Barry. It's great to be back here again. My name is Eric Pratt. I represent uh, most of Scott County, so the communities of Shakopee, Prior Lake, uh, Jordan, uh, Credit River, along with uh, five townships. Uh, grew up in Prior Lake. My mom was a teacher in Shakopee for uh, 25 years in sixth grade. And uh, prior to joining the Senate, I was on the Prior Lake School Board. I spent 12 years on the school board. Um, so I don't know if maybe that qualified me for the Senate, but uh, <laughs> you don't have to pass a test to get elected, I guess. Um, but anyway, it's, it's great to be here. I chair the uh, Jobs Committee. I also serve on finance, um, transportation, and state government. Do, do I recall from your prior appearances that you had a background in banking maybe? Is that, do I have that right? You're right. I spent uh, 30 years in uh, financial services uh, doing mostly consumer credit, um, mortgage credit. Um, I, I got involved with uh, credit cards and debit cards. I spent uh, almost a decade uh, in fraud prevention and identity theft prevention. So, um, yeah, those are yeah. real growth areas, unfortunately. <laughs> also joining us is Representative Todd Lippert from uh, District 20B in Northfield. Uh, Representative Lippert, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself, issues of priority, uh, maybe your uh, day job, things of that sort. Sure. Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you tonight. I'm Todd Lippert. I'm the state rep for the Northfield, Dundas, Lonsdale, Montgomery area in southeast Minnesota. I'm in my second term in the House. I'm an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ, and I've served local churches in Wisconsin and also in Northfield. And um, key issues of mine, I think there are real opportunities this session for us to be lowering the cost of child care for Minnesota families. And that's a, a deep a issue of deep concern for families. And it also is a workforce issue and it help us um, get more adults into the workforce so we can lower those costs of child care. We have a need for affordable housing across the state. It's a rural issue, it's a metro issue, um, and we can make a big investment in affordable housing. Climate change is always a concern of mine, um, and I have a particular uh, concern for the needs of rural communities. I grew up in a town of 700 people myself and have served churches in small towns intentionally. Um, I think we can make a big investment in weatherization uh, to make and kind of kill multiple birds with one stone. So. Uh, lower uh, energy costs for households, make sure that families have houses that are warm in the, win warm in the winter time, cool in the summertime, that are ho homes that are safe. Uh, make sure that we have uh, Minnesotans have the opportunity to have um, housing with dignity, uh, no matter what. So these are some opportunities I think are in front of us this session and issues that are of concern to me. I had the privilege of uh, attending an ordination on Saturday of a new ELCA pastor, and uh, I appreciate the work that uh, you do, Representative Lippert, uh, uh, the, um, the service that was provided by members of the clergy to individual citizens and residents of Minnesota doesn't get much attention, but um, it's really important, and um, I'm grateful for that. Also joining us is Representative Chris Wazinski from District 16A in Ghent, Minnesota. Representative Wazinski, uh, again, a frequent guest. Uh, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Certainly, uh, Justice uh, Barry Anderson. Uh, we just uh, appreciate all the good folks from uh, public television tuning in tonight to get engaged in politics and, and just the direction of our state. Um, I represent a district down in southwest Minnesota. House District 16A has got Lincoln or Lyon County, Yellow Madison County, Lockborough County, a little sliver of Redwood County. Uh, highly agricultural area. I farm. Uh, I have a small welding business. I uh, have a wife and some children, and uh, we just enjoy ourselves out here and uh, in our great prairie lands during the winter, summer, and fall and spring. And uh, you know we are working hard down in St. Paul. Our main focus really this year is uh, you know reacting. Uh, really to the issues that are, are coming at us from Washington, D.C., uh, the high energy costs that I hear from families that are 
uh, struggling to make ends meet, uh, not by just government intervention by you know paying for things, but actually looking at the issues that are causing and driving those high costs. Uh, the high cost of food, you know, we're looking at the uh, high inflation rates. Uh, we just saw that last month, 7.5% uh, inflation rate for one month. Uh, folks, we uh, are on the verge of some bad stuff when it comes to families and businesses being able to make ends meet. And, and really that's what our focus needs to be here in St. Paul. Um, you know, a lot of other things that we hear about uh, when talking to constituents, they're very concerned about the increase in crime and public safety. Um, a lot of folks that I talk to um, are learned about their safety uh, across the state uh, when they're traveling, whether it's carjackings, whether it's thefts, whether it's uh, uh, Cadillac converters being stolen uh, from small things to big things. I mean, I know three people personally that have been carjacked in the Twin Cities. And I think that's a big concern for people in rural Minnesota, but also folks uh, throughout the state, metro, urban, and the rest. And so those are some of the big areas, obviously agriculture as a passion of mine, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, the convergence of uh, a big government, high regulation, uh, you know, it, and a lot of pandemic issues uh, that are affecting businesses and families. Uh, we need to be looking at ways to uh, lower the cost of doing business, not through government subsidies, but by actually going after the things that are driving the high cost of doing business in Minnesota. And one of the major things that we can do, and we can really just do it next week, uh, we can focus on the uh, unemployment insurance uh, that's about to really start hitting our small town businesses all across the state uh, with heavy loads of increased taxes. And the state legislature can step up right now uh, and help alleviate the problem that it caused. And so those are the issues I think we really need to focus on. And uh, we got a lot of work to do, a lot of great ideas. Uh, one of the first learned uh, when coming to St. Paul is there's a big difference between having an idea and a good idea. And so it's our job to sift those two out and, and, and do the best job we can. Well, very good. Well, let's go right to the questions that our viewers have provided us. I warned our panel, we, we, uh, we had a little uh, dry run on one of these inquiries and uh, I warned our panel we'd probably start there. And no sooner do I say that, but a second, uh, a second viewer has a similar question. So a viewer from Nicollet County and from that famous Minnesota County uh, unknown uh, both have the same issue that they'd like to have us visit about. Wondering what the plans are for dealing with chronic wasting disease, what will be done to stop the spread and protect deer, and another and, and uh, our other viewer has a very specific inquiry about a specific bill uh, that addresses the need for compliance on chronic uh, wasting disease, uh, and um, noting the concerns about uh, uh, DNR involvement and um, what, if anything, should be done here. Uh, suggesting that perhaps perhaps something should be done uh, sooner rather than later. Let's start with Senator Kunish. You and I kicked this off. Uh, I don't know that you're necessarily the expert on this, but but you're first. So uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, what you've heard about the issue and what you can tell our viewers. Well, what I know about chronic wasting disease, and no, I'm not a, a deer farm uh, farmer, nor am I a deer hunter, but I know plenty and have plenty of families. And this isn't a new issue for Minnesota. Uh, when I was in the house, we had uh, champions like crazy, like um, Representative Hansen and Representative Be Becker Finn, who recognized the um, the, the threat that this chronic uh, wasting disease has for our, our deer and actually for agriculture when you think about it. Um, and I know that um, there was a ban that was suggested by the commissioner, Commissioner Strawman, and she, uh, you know, she's the She's the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And uh, much like this, this pandemic we've been in, I know that she um, called for a statewide ban on the movement of farmed white-tailed deer so that um, they could keep it under control. And I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe there were a number of counties, um, a number of counties in Beltrami uh, County, excuse me, a number of areas of that air of that county that tested positive for uh, CWD 
And uh, it's not like it just passes through breathing or by um, feces or that sort of thing, but it actually um, puts like, um, forget what it's called, prions, prions, or anyways, it's right. some kind of protein into the ground. And so that can, that can uh, last for several years on the ground. So it's not like it just, you know, when we get a super freeze, it's gone. And so um, it continues to infect animals um, long after, you know, the, the infected animal dies. And so I think it certainly is uh, a concern for, for um, all across Minnesota because we have hunters in, that go out into the, into um, greater Minnesota to hunt throughout the years. And um, I think that it's really important that we take, um, take a really concerted effort. And I know that they've been working really, really hard in the house to get this done. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I hate to tell you, I don't know exactly what um, what the, the outcome or what they're suggesting, but I believe that um, they are, they've got solutions and they're working hard on it. And I do think it's something that we have to um, address before, you know, it really affects all of our deer, whether they're wild or not. Let's go to a house member for some uh, input on this. Representative Swazinski, what do you, what do you think? Uh, Chronic wasting disease, deer, et cetera. My pro my guess is in your part of the state, there probably are a few deer. So, yeah, abs well, absolutely. We've got, uh, you know, a lot of uh, deer farmers out in uh, kind of all around the state. Um, you know, a lot of this discussion has driven a lot of those business owners uh, to just move their operation across the border. Um, there's been a lot of concern uh, from a sportsman's perspective on the development of those diseases. Um, and you know what that means to our wild deer flock. There's been a lot of conversation about how to potentially double fence. So you you know essentially if you're a deer farmer, you would put you know the state would fund a double fence to kind of have a bit of a buffer between uh, the outside and the inside uh, of, of pens. There's been talk about uh, the state buying out these herds, uh, paying full full lock stock barrel price for all the animals. Um, you know I think that there is a, a lot of the worst thing we do is take a shotgun approach. Uh, to, to, to a big issue. And, uh, you know, these are families' businesses, these are families, but it's also a way of life for a lot of people and hunting and family. And so we need to take a very scientific approach to it. Uh, it was talked about in, in one of the hearings, I remember last year, that the prawns, which uh, uh, Senator Kanish, Kanish Padin uh, spoke about, could pot potentially be passed on to humans. And, you know, that's just there's a lot of misinformation out there and it's really unfortunate. And so, uh, you know, we've got to be uh, looking at the science on things, but also working with, with business owners and farmers. And there's a big tug of war, uh, quite frankly, between the animal health and the DNR, a lot of territorial issues uh, kind of root in there and get your foot in the door. Uh, you know, right now I know there's regulations where you have a, a person from the board of animal health uh, going to some of these uh, deer farmers, um, but because of a law they passed, the DNRs and fully armed uh, DNR officer standing over their shoulder. And so you know, that can be a bit intimidating to, to, to families uh, when children that are out working uh, and just kind of trying to make a living in rural Minnesota, wherever they're at. And so we need to step lightly with these issues, but I don't make a difference. Um, you know, animal diseases are exceptionally important um, beyond just a, a, a deer disease problem. Uh, we just uh, got word through the USDA uh, that there is a uh, avian influenza, highly pathogenic uh, avian flu that was discovered in a, in a flock down in Indiana. And so the Board of Animal Health really needs the tools that it needs uh, so that we can quickly react if anything like that would happen to come to our flocks uh, throughout Minnesota, whether it be chickens or turkeys. Um, uh, at times those diseases come in from, from wild into into some of the confinement areas. And so uh, we really need to be uh, very diligent. Uh, diseases are important when it comes to animal agriculture and uh, being able to react, react quickly. So. Representative Lippert, any thoughts on the chronic wasting disease issues? Yeah, you know, I think the reality is that the farm deer herd has, and the movement of deer has accelerated the spread of CWD across the state. And it really puts our wild deer herd at risk. And so um, at minimum, we we have to have a moratorium on the movement of deer. 
unfortunately, there have been some deer farmers that have not been responsible actors. And so we've seen CWD spread very quickly from one part of the state to another. And um, we that, that has to stop. And, and there's a very serious conversation now about uh, buying out these herds. There aren't that many uh, deer herds, but there are so many hunters across our state and it's such an important tradition. And the wild deer herd is, is such a key part of the ecosystems across Minnesota. Uh, and so we, we don't want the wild deer herd to be at risk. Um, and, you know, the conversation about um, whether these herds should be bought out is a very serious one. And I expect that conversation to continue in the house this year. Senator Pratt. Well, I, I don't, we have a few deer farms down here in Scott County. And in fact, I got a chance to tour one with one of our, our farmers. And I can tell you, you know, as, as Representative Lippert said, most of our farmers are good, are good folks. They're responsible. They're doing the right thing. Um, I, I, uh, I don't know that I agree with the shotgun approach. And, you know, what was interesting about this deer farmer is he said that there's this new test that they've been, they've been looking at uh, to test live deer. That would that's that's like 80 90 for percent effective and I think we should be looking at that rather than trying to buy out herds or um, uh, putting a moratorium on somebody's business where they can't you know where they can't uh, uh, move their herds if there's options to get around it we should be exploring those we have um... A question from our, one of our Facebook uh, viewers about the minimum wage. Wants, this viewer wants to know uh, what are the chances for a, a uh, uh, increase in the minimum wage in this uh, session. Uh, this topic has had some discussion over year, recent years, and of course uh, the run-up uh, in uh, wages as a result of uh, shortages and so forth, uh, you know, it's, it's put a little different spin on it, but the question hasn't gone away. And this viewer is wondering, whether or not there will be any discussion about the minimum wage in this session. Let's start with you, Senator Pratt. What, what about the minimum wage? Well, you know, what, what I've seen is, is with a, a, a shortage of, of uh, applicants for jobs. I mean, our workforce is still 100,000 people lower than it was at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, wages are on the rise. And I don't know why we, why, why we would really need to look at raising the minimum wage when Currently, market rate wages are so far ahead of where we are. Um, it just it, it doesn't seem like it's that big of an issue. Uh, I think the bigger issue is looking at how we can uh, help pull people back into the workforce. Uh, and one of the things that I've been looking at is, is uh, the, the uh, unemployment insurance deficit, making sure that we pay that down um, lower or, or not increase the payroll taxes that employers will be paying so that they can afford to hire workers and pay that market rate wage. So I don't see this being a, a huge issue. Um, it hasn't come up on my radar so far, and and uh, I'd be surprised if it, if it really does. Representative Lippert, what about the minimum wage, your thoughts? So, you know, my thought is, is does your wage allow you to live? You know, are we moving towards living wages? And uh, you know, Senator Pratt talked about how wages are rising right now as there's as you know we're seeing workforce issues um, across sectors. Uh, I think more of a it's more likely there's going to be a conversation in this session about particular sectors and whether their wages are able to keep up, especially those sectors that uh, rely on state support. So in the caregiving caregiving sectors, for example, child care elder care, uh, care for people with disabilities, uh, they rely on a reimbursement rate from the state. And, uh, you know, I'm hearing from a Center for People with Disabilities in Northfield that they cannot pay wages. They keep up with the Quick Trip, keep up with McDonald's. Um, and so that's going to need more state support. We need to make sure that our elders are able to get the care they need, people with disabilities are able to get the care they need, uh, child care, make sure that uh, our families can get uh, the care they need for their children. And the state's going to even need to be a stronger partner. And with um, the surplus that we have, we have an opportunity to, to take a big step in that direction um, that'll help us uh, make sure that people in critical sectors like caregiving um, have a living wage and can take care of their families and their household with the wage they're receiving. Uh, Senator Kunish, minimum wage.
unmute myself here. Uh, now, this, I, this is, uh, we, not, you can't get through a program without somebody saying you need to unmute yourself. It's a, it's a Zoom yeah, requirement. I don't want to be, I don't want to be that person. Okay. I'm just not going to be that person <laughs> here. Um, but I think um, if I'm not mistaken, I think that there was an increase in the minimum wage um, that that adjusted for inflation as of January 1st. But the really, and that sounds great, you know, this automatic increase, but um, it's still only like $10.33 an hour for large employees and only $8.42 an hour for um, other uh, uh, employees. And so I don't quite understand how uh, anybody could live on, on that. And so while it might increase um, through inflation, it certainly hasn't kept up with inflation, just as Senator or um, uh, Representative um, said that it, it, it uh, that the, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Oh, that inflation has gone up so high in just a month. So um, we haven't been able to, to keep up with that in a way that um, really allows a family or a person to live uh, in a dignified way, just as Representative Lippert said. And so I think that um, I don't know that we will be dealing with that uh, minimum wage because employers are recognizing that they have to pay those top wages in order to attract and retain those employees. Um, I think folks are coming out of the pandemic realizing that they've got a lot more options than they had before. Um, they can explore new avenues of uh, employment or profession. They can go back and get retrained in different ways. And so um, I think it's just really important that we are looking for ways to ensure that Minnesotans um, are, are um, participating in a really strong economy that works for everybody. And that means, of course, uh, making sure that there is child care and that um, those folks that uh, are providing the child care are adequate, adequately and safely compensated. It means, um, you know, perhaps some, some um, really strategic tax cuts for families like middle income, lower income families that are trying to uh, pull themselves out of this pandemic and, you know, looking at their options in the future. Um, so we have to look at a lot of different things that are going to allow our families to thrive coming out of this pandemic. And of course, housing and health care um, and of how we're going to help um, our schools, all of those things are going to make a big difference. Uh, so I don't know that that we will be addressing the, the minimum wage, but um, certainly not something that we, we ever forget about. Representative Swazinski, the minimum wage, your thoughts on that? Well, I certainly hope we don't do anything with the minimum wage. Uh, you know, the question really asked, of, will you raise the minimum wage so that this uh, questioner can help uh, make ends meet. And I think that's very concerning. Um, and it should be concerning to all the legislators, the governor, um, and also the Biden administration, uh, because we've seen huge amount of inflation. We talk, well, this needs to keep up with inflation. Uh, seven seven and a half percent in one month uh, when it comes to the increased costs of, of living, uh, whether that's gasoline, whether it's utility bills, whether it's your groceries, whether it's a gallon of milk, um, whether it's uh, just the basic things to make life go. And our government, our federal government, is printing money on an unprecedented scale, trillions of dollars, trillions and trillions of dollars over the last few years. And that is the, the fruit of that labor. And there is decreased value in those dollars that we're getting. So you can say, well, we're just going to raise the minimum wage, look what we did. But the cost of living is going up a lot faster than those dollars will ever be able to keep up to. And whether it's money consumption and inflationary issues, with the cost of gasoline to get to work, um, you know, there are a lot of jobs available that pay 20 and $30 an hour. The biggest issue we have is do our skill sets, the folks that are looking to move up the scale, match the jobs that are available uh, in those particular areas that are gonna pay more. You know, I went to school for welding. I could go up the street any place. I could drive within 50 minutes of where I go and probably find 25, 35 to $50 an hour 
uh, without much trouble at all. Um, but um, how do you match those folks up um, through technical training, through our educational system? Um, and so unique things like Minnesota West Community, technically and community college down in Southwest Minnesota does an excellent job of getting skill sets in short periods of time so that folks can move up that chain and move up that ladder um, so that they can really, you know, essentially move their economic status into a different place. And I think that's the way we need to be able to focus. You know, Lippert, uh, Representative Lippert talked a little bit about um, our, our nursing homes. Um, that, that is a crisis. Um, the folks that work in our nursing homes and our, our group homes, uh, working with folks that are disabled and elderly, uh, that is tough work. And, you know, I agree 100% that we need to do a little bit of something there to try to increase the wages. But also when there's so many choices on things to do, to say, would you rather be paid $15 an hour working in a nursing home or $10 working behind a, a, a cash register um, at the local gas station? Um, a lot of folks are saying, well, I'd still rather just work behind just because of the less stress, less pressure um, in those types of jobs. So you know, that training and, and that ability to move up the chain, I think are, are, are big parts of that. But you know, an arbitrary number um, for a minimum wage, I think is just quite frankly foolish. Um, at this point in time, we've got taxes raising uh, on Minnesota businesses. If we don't uh, eliminate this unemployment tax, that's going to be hitting businesses to the point of $2.7 billion across our state. Um, that's going to erase a lot of economic opportunity for Minnesotans, regardless of pay. Uh, all I'll say about your um, welding career, uh, Representative Swazinski, is that I very nearly failed seventh grade shop. Mr. TC was not impressed with my uh, <laughs> uh, my tool skills, and so uh, you you are earning every dime of uh, of uh, that money that you get uh, welding. Uh, we're very happy to have you there. So. Uh, uh, it's an important skill. Representative Lippert, I want to go back to you. Uh, we have um, uh, we have a viewer from Edina that wants to talk about, uh, she's a, he or she is a resident of a long-term care facility there and they're wondering about legislation that might be moving forward in this session dealing with long-term care facilities, nursing homes, and so forth. I think part of it is uh, the topic that Representative Swazinski mentioned with respect to compensation, but I think it's broader than that in terms of opportunities for people. And, and uh, um, I think this viewer is concerned that uh, residents of uh, long-term care facilities sometimes are forgotten. And so Representative Lippert, let's go to you to start with. What, uh, what, if anything, can you share with us on that topic? Well, we need to make sure that um, everyone is valued um, at every stage of life. And we need to make sure that we're valuing our elders and um, making sure that they can access the care that's needed and that we're valuing those who are providing that care is is key to that. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, we've had plenty of challenges through the pandemic, and uh, long-term care has just been a, a very difficult place um, these last couple of years because of COVID. Uh, you know, I think I will be having some uh, had some conversation this session, carrying a bill uh, related to making sure that that in future pandemics that um, people in res in nursing homes will always be able to have access to a primary um, loved one, that that loved one can visit them with, with uh, making sure that they have, are following proper protocols when they're in the facility. It's going to be a recommendation of the long-term care ombudsman uh, because we know that loneliness is also a severe health concern and mental health concern. And we were seeing that in heartbreaking ways um, in our nursing facilities. Um, at the same time as as department of our department of health and other department of health across the country were doing everything they could to uh, limit the spread of covid and keep people alive within nursing homes uh, so we've seen such difficult challenges um, but going forward hopefully you know we're on the um, we're glad to see that case numbers are falling rapidly because of uh, the uh, peak of the omicron wave hopefully going forward uh, we can be focused on focusing on um, wages in nursing homes to make sure that we're valuing the caregivers who are providing that care. And I think as we're dealing with workforce shortages, which are going to keep happening because of a demographic shift, we're going to have to be really focused on areas where we need people and caregiving is one. And we're simply going to have to value the people who are providing care and uh, the state's going to need to be a stronger partner in providing uh, reimbursement rates and wages there. Um, and so making sure that we have a workforce and care facilities is going to be key. 
Senator Pratt, nursing home issues. Your thoughts? Well, nursing well, home and extended long-term care. Yeah, Go ahead, they're sorry. crucial. Uh, I serve on the board of uh, St. Gertrude's here in Shakopee, and we run uh, a long-term care facility, a rehab facility, memory care, assisted living. Um, and our biggest issue is finding people to, to come to work. I know Senator Abler is working on a package of, of proposals uh, to help attract people to the uh, uh, to the long-term care nursing home uh, uh, facilities, um, retention bonuses, you know, help with training. Um, he'll be rolling that out, I believe, uh, next week sometime. And um, I think you know our caucus is excited about it. I mean, this isn't a Greater Minnesota. It's not a, a Metro. It's it's not a, a, a DFL or a Republican issue. We all have these. We all have this. Uh, these facilities that are struggling, um, and so I, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, pulling that support in, and and we're, we're get, you know, we're we're still uh, trying to get nurses in uh, to help uh, close that gap. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's the number one issue we face. At least on the nursing home that I'm on on the board of, and and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, helping create those retention bonuses. And and like Representative Lippert said, we do value those those employees. Um, we just need help recognizing it often as as you know as as we'd like. Senator Kunish, nursing homes, long term care facilities, related uh, problems. Well, um, I just I just have to thank those that um, have worked and do continue to work in these facilities. I have uh, my mother was in a long term facility for about five years before she passed away as a result of a um, uh, uh, procedure that didn't didn't go quite the way it was supposed to. So the issue that we have is not new um, since the pandemic. The issue, a lot of the issues that are here today are um, just exacerbated by the pandemic. I think that in the past, um, the, the, you know, insufficient pay, the lack of appreciation, um, and the kind of work, it's a hard job. It's not a, it's not an attractive job, but it really takes a unique person to do that. And throughout the pandemic, many, many of those folks were, um, you know, went into work when nobody else could go in there because of quarantines, when loved ones weren't able to come in and sit with their, their residents or, uh, the the employees themselves got sick and weren't able to come home uh come to work and so you know now we have um you know the governor has our uh, military folks in there doing the work and and we appreciate that but i think what we have to really look at again with the whole economics and the jobs um uh, situation that we have here in Minnesota, we have to make sure that we are paying these people, that we are are really showing the appreciation in a financial way. They work hard. It's physical. They work long hours. Um, they all have unique skills and talents with, with our uh, loved ones. And uh, we should be compensating them appropriately. The other thing that goes into that, of course, is the nurses uh, shortage. Our nurses um, and our, our hospital, our care are exhausted. They're just absolutely exhausted. And remember, these were the front line workers. These were the ones that were working uh, long hours, oftentimes not going home because they had to quarantine themselves. And so we have an opportunity to really stop for a minute, take a deep breath, look at what this situation is and build the kind of care system where not only the nurses and those that are, are, are cleaning the rooms and providing the food and the physical therapy, that not only are they, they being paid appropriately, but we are showing the appreciation that they all deserve 
Um, and I think we're going to have to do that in a lot of different uh, spectrums within our, our um, society going forward. Uh, Red Baron Suzwinski, your thoughts? Well, I think I kind of touched on it a little bit with my the last question. So right, you you I did mention to... it, yes. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Senator Kunish, let's go to you with a question we have from a viewer about an education issue. Um, your status as a required uh, as a retired educator earned you the privilege of answering this question uh, first. Um, <laughs> this viewer is concerned about the status of the Page Amendment. Um, which, of course, uh, has been discussed uh, at least a couple of sessions, I think. And maybe we can also talk about whether or not there might be some other constitutional amendments, because this is the year when you, when you would expect those to be placed on the ballot for the voters to act on in November. But let's talk about the Page Amendment first. Um, and not to put you on the spot, but I'm sure you've had some discussions with people. Um, what do you think his chances are? Maybe tell our viewers a little bit about it if you can. Well, um, the first thing I know is that um, um, Chair Chamberlain says no, <laughs> and uh, he is the chair of education, and therefore he will be uh, the one that decides what gets heard and what doesn't get heard in our education committee. And I don't, uh, I, I, from what I understand, I, he is not in favor of this amendment. And um, what this amendment does is basically is just changing the language. It's a constitutional amendment that will change the language um, that, oh, I, if I couldn't remember um, what our constitution says. Our constitution says it's our responsibility to provide, um, um, is it an adequate or a, a good education, right. public education? And um, he, uh, the amendment changes that word um, in a way that I don't really feel it makes um, any difference. Changing a constitutional amendment um, by changing a word to say, um, oh gosh, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly what it was, what it is, but um, I, I, this is, it is our responsibility as a legislature to provide the funds to educate our kids in a public education. And we have never adequately um, paid for fully funded our education. And now here we have a surplus. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, I think that um, there is good meaning and there's good discussion. I think the fact that the page amendment is really trying to get at the disparities uh, within our students and our students of colors, but um, creating this this amendment, I don't think is the answer. And I think we have an opportunity here and now to um, to to really look at how we can. I hate to say rebuild, but reimagine what we might uh, you know what a really good educational system looks like and how we can really make a difference uh, going forward, especially with this surplus, um, to really fully and um, uh, uh, um, intentionally create an educational system that is uh, really centered on equity, not so much equality. And equity is not the same as equal. It means making sure that our, uh, our students and our school districts are receiving the resources that they need in their unique district to create a really well-rounded uh, educational system. Uh, in greater Minnesota, they struggle with the cost of transporting their kids, you know, miles and miles and miles um, on buses, where in the Twin Cities, you don't have to have that problem. Um, uh, there's um, the public, there's the um, special education subsidy, all these unfunded mandates that our school districts have had to deal with for so long. We have to stop doing that to our school districts fully fund it and make sure that that the resources are going to be there for um, for our students, especially coming out of this pandemic, when there's going to be a lot of uh, variables um, and trying to meet our students where they are. 
Representative Lippert, your thoughts on the Page Amendment and any other constitutional amendments you think might be likely? Sure. So I had a, a chance to look up the language quickly. Um, and so I believe the language is if, uh, every child deserves a fundamental right to a quality public education. And, uh, you know, I think when when um, the, Justice the Internet speaks, is certainly useful for some things here. <laughs> That's right. Ahead. A little refresher of the memory. Uh, when Justice Page speaks, people listen. And so I think it's it's definitely sparked uh, an important conversation. And the, and the concern is is racial equity. And Justice Page will be uh, clear about that. And he wants every child to have an excellent education regardless of the color of their skin or where they live. And uh, those are values shared um, um, by so many at the Capitol. I think the question is, you know, is will this amendment help us accomplish what we desire uh, for all children across Minnesota? And uh, so there's a deep discussion about, about that, whether this is the best way to get to the outcomes we desire, if this might have some unintended consequences, uh, uh, you know, more, more vouchers, more, uh, in some states, perhaps it's been a backdoor to vouchers. Um, I'm concerned about, you know, for myself and others on uh, in my caucus, we want to make sure that we're really investing and strengthening always our public education system. Um, so that's been some of the context of the conversation as as I've been participating in it. Um, I don't um, I don't know if that amendment's gaining traction this session. I think uh, what to do with the 7.7 .7 billion dollar surplus. The best way to use that is what's kind of uh, absorbing, taking the uh, air out of the room right now. Um, and I haven't heard any uh, any other constitutional amendment conversations at this point um, in my circles in the House. Senator Pratt. Yeah, well, I mean, this is this is a really hot topic. Um, you know, as, as Representative Lippert said, the, the language talks about uh, you know, a, a, a quality, a quality education, a quality public education as a civil right. And I really like the idea that, that we're focusing on quality rather than the system. Uh, that's putting the kids, you know, putting the kids first. The concern I hear from parents is the wording around uh, public education and whether or not that allows for school choice. What does that mean for homeschool parents? What does that mean for private school students? It's, um, and, and that's, that's some of the concern that I'm hearing. Uh, school choice, when we talk about equity, school choice is maybe one of the, the best things that we can, we can do. Um, we've talked to parents in Minneapolis who uh, would be able to move their kids if they had the means to do it. Somehow we allow school choice for families with the means to afford it, but for low and middle income families that, that can't, they don't have that same option. And I think that's immoral. I think every student should have access to a quality education that meets their needs because not every, not every student is meant to uh, fit within the, the, same, uh, the same system. And I say this as a son of a public school teacher and someone who is a public school advocate. I, I support our public school uh, system. I served on the school board for 12 years. Uh, I'm not trying to undermine public schools at all. I'm trying to say that we need to be able to focus on the needs of the student first and making sure that they're successful in the classroom and making sure that we still have the ability to have parents and, and community involved. And one of the things that we've seen through the pandemic and as we've seen this shift from in-person to online to masking and not masking is more parents are opting to homeschool or find private schools than they are the public option. And that's what makes this idea of choice within the Page Amendment so very important. Representative Sosinski, your thoughts? Page Amendment related issues? Well, you know, I, I, I kind of agree with some of the sentiments. I don't think the Page Amendment is going to probably get the traction it needs to kind of make it over the hurdle. Uh, you know, I think the passion behind uh, uh, Mr. Page and his supporters is is in the right direction, right? Uh, mm -hmm. What do you do to close that achievement gap between uh, folks of color uh, and try to bring folks together? Because, you know, we all understand that, uh, you know, building a building on strong foundation is the best possible way to build a building. Uh, 
Well, building a life on a strong education is uh, one of the best things you can possibly do with your life. And you know, uh, being in a challenging, uh, uh, robust educational system uh, with strong standards, strong uh, expectations, uh, not just for students, but for educators, I think uh, uh, we've gotten away from that. I mean, I just read an article uh, about a couple of weeks ago talking about how Mississippi, uh, who spends probably half of what we do here in the state of Minnesota on education, is actually finding success in closing the achievement gap. Uh, with their urban students uh, in the rest of the state. And so, you know, what we need to be doing is this might be a good chance for a very broad approach to say, is is the changing the Constitution going to fix it? But uh, is allowing parents to have a say in the child's education, uh, whether it's public, whether it's private, whether it's homeschool, and what does the state's role play in that? And I hear from a lot of parents, uh, there was a Wisconsin uh, state legislator just the other day saying, well, if parents really want to say in their education, they should just pull their kids out of public education and homeschool them or uh, send them to private school. Well, the parents I talk to do want to say, and it's unfortunate that the Department of Education, uh, the uh, National Association of School Boards uh, has uh, labeled parents who want to have a say in their the children's education called them domestic terrorists. And that was approved by the Biden administration. And I have not heard a word of uh, from Governor Walls and his ability to push back against that uh, policy that they push forward falsely. Um, but, you know, I think that's some of the things that we need to get to. How do parents get more engaged and how do they actually engage in their students' lives to make it better? And it's not by shutting them out of school board meetings. It's not about uh, a lot of those issues that we hear all about day in, day out. And, you know, the school, uh, I know the teachers union is against the Page Amendment, and that should maybe tell you a lot. Um, you know, if you're stuck in an urban school that is failing, and you don't have the money to homeschool, and you don't have the money to send your child to private school, and you don't have the money to bus your child to Edina because they're already full, you like this amendment. You like an opportunity to challenge the system because the system that exists that is controlled by powerful interest groups is failing kids. And uh, we really need to challenge it and be willing to step out of our, our support base and, and push back against special interests for what's best for children across the state. So we have about five minutes left. And I, I think this next question may chew, may chew up most of that five minutes. A viewer wants to know whether or not we really have a surplus um, given the uh, unemployment fund shortages and other things. Um, we have to lay on top of that the announcement from MMB today that uh, 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 tax receipts were up substantially. Um, so maybe we can be t maybe we can talk a little bit about what the extent of that surplus is, uh, how much of it is long term versus one time money, uh, and um, maybe a little bit about what the priority should be going forward with any of the with any of that surplus. Let's start with you, Representative Swazinski, uh, and then we'll go around the table. And I think that'll probably take our, our last few minutes here. The floor is yours. Certainly, I'll go quickly since we have just a couple of minutes. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, surpluses are are nice to have compared to deficits. Uh, starting a career in, uh, in the legislature with a multi-billion dollar deficit and not having to raise taxes to solve it. Um, there is a lot of things to unwind uh, in this. So where does the money come from? Is it because of uh, federal printed money that we've received through grants uh, and, and other processes that have backfilled different parts of accounts and the rest? Um, you know, so what we need to be focusing on is what are the biggest issues facing uh, our e economy here in the state of Minnesota? And the chances of taxes rising on businesses that are just trying to make ends meet, the chances of uh, families that are seeing high costs in energy, high costs in food, high costs in uh, just making their lives live um, needs to be our top priority uh, and returning dollars back to them uh, in the way they pay them in taxes. I think if we can see some, some very targeted uh, tax relief on those who paid taxes, uh, I think we'll be a, a lot better boost to our economy and, and help uh, us in the, uh, and the next generation move forward. Representative Lippert, your thoughts? Sure. So. Um... Uh, my colleague in the House has been talking about inflation quite a bit. You know, I just want to share that what's really driving inflation is a pandemic. Uh, and inflation isn't just happening in the United States. It's happening globally. Uh, it's being 
driven by the pandemic and a, a global supply shortage, which is which is driving up prices. And the reason we have a surplus is that the American Rescue Plan of the Biden administration did some rescuing. And so the receipts of businesses are higher than was expected, than anyone was expected, because um, our economy is much stronger because of good federal policy. So now the question is, is what do we do with this opportunity we have? And we still have great needs in our state. Um, families are struggling to afford child care. There are families that are paying as much as $30,000 for child care, which is just hard to fathom. How, how is that sustainable at all? So my, my focus and the focus of my caucus is, is on uh, families and workers and want to make sure that we're really meeting those uh, those deep needs. Um, you know, the unemployment trust fund is another seconds. part of the oh, another part of the conversation. Um, as long as we're focused on workers at the same time, we can um, we'll be engaging in that conversation. That's going to be it for this evening's program. I'm sorry we didn't get to our last two guests on what to do with the budget, but we'll have you back in weeks ahead. The budget, the surplus will still be there and we'll have a chance to talk about it then. Uh, I want to thank all of our participants and I want to thank our viewers who called in with so many great questions this evening. We hope that you'll join us next week and all the weeks that follow for your legislators. Thank you and good night. Your legislators is made possible by the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers. On the web at MFU.org.